Hello, my name is Mike Coleman. This is a re-recording of a talk which I gave to the Border Historical Society in July 2022. It is a little bit updated and edited since then, but essentially it is the same. It's an investigation into a family history and particularly the deep history behind it and the way in which one can put this together particularly in this day and age of the internet. So where do we come from as a people? Who do we come from? Most of us can look back into some kind of family ancestry. In my case, we go to a little village, hardly even a village called Glouston, right in the middle of England in Leicestershire, which has always been small. It's a dozen houses, a pub and church. It's always been there, we're not quite sure, absolutely for certain, but certainly it was there in 1086 by written record in the Doomsday Book, and probably from about 200 AD in Roman times, Roman occupation of Britain by the archaeological evidence, and more recently by DNA, we can possibly even trace a way back to almost 4,000 years before the Christian era, in other words, 6,000 years ago. So the presentation is based on DNA, on archaeology, particularly the University of Leicester archaeological services, which are outstanding, the history, the written records, YouTube videos, which are just amazing, the genealogy databases, and especially Ancestry.com. So it's a story of continuity and stability and custom and tradition through 6,000 years, not just of our family, but certainly representative of many of you watching this. Where is Glouston? Glouston is there right in the middle of England. There it is right in the middle of the fields. And there it is, and you can see it's a tiny, hardly even qualifies as a village. And then a case of who do we come from? Well, in the case of the Coleman family, there are some of our ancestors peacefully in the churchyard at Glouston. And as far as our history is concerned, we come from Neolithic hunter-gatherers, from Celtic farmers, from Bronze Age pastoralists, from Iron Age charcoal burners, since the name Coleman comes from charcoal burners, not from coal in the sense of black mineral, and particularly from the Angle people who have always been regarded as part of the Anglo-Saxon history of England, but as far as I'm concerned, the concentration is on the Angle portion. So where do you start with something like this? I think all of us start with family stories and memories. Opa said this, grandmother said that, Aunt Emily knew about that little bit, and so on. And then the formal history and archaeology, beliefs and traditions and customs are enormously important, but often neglected. And then much more recently, genetics, DNA studies, and traditional genealogy. The sort of sources you can go to on the BBC. There was a TV series, Michael Wood's Story of England, which focused on a humble Midlands village, which is about 10 kilometers from Gloucester. The kind of DNA analysis that comes out, analysis of five generations of a family in one 6,000 year old tomb. More recently, Old English place names as a repository of traditional ecological knowledge, the names themselves reveal facets of the landscape that you couldn't imagine to start with. And then we get much more focused. Paul Bowman's doctoral dissertation, the Langton 100, which is an area right next door to Glouston. It's just literally just over the road. More recently, 2018, John Blair's enormous work, a lifetime summary, a 
of a career on building Anglo-Saxon England. On the YouTube, on the DNA side, one that you should particularly look for is David Reich of Harvard University, probably the world leader in this field, and particularly in terms of putting together the different fields of study of, yes, the genetics, but putting those together with the archaeology and the history and putting it into simple terms that lay people like you and me can understand. And then even as recently as September last year, September 2022, the most recent study, the Anglo-Saxon migration and formation of the early English gene pool. So where do we come from over this history of virtually unknown to me Bernard Cornwall, the historical writer and writer behind, for example, the Sharp series and of the more recent new Netflix and uh, sometimes not on Netflix, on other channels, but of The Last Kingdom, which some of you may have had the pleasure of watching. He draws attention to the fact that British people are brought up with a knowledge of history that starts in 1066. Anything before that is quite unknown. And this was something I found certainly in my own experience. And it was therefore that period prior to 1066 that I wanted to know more about. Where did my people come from? So after the Ice Age, there were hunter-gatherers in Britain. Then there were Neolithic farmers. Then there were steppe pastoralists, which is where most of you watching this and certainly the audience who heard it last year, it really points to the fact that actually you descended, most of you, from a bunch of Ukrainian horse thieves, which seems quite contemporary at the moment. And then there was the 2000 years of conventional history period of Romans, Angles, Vikings, Normans, Tudors, and right up to the present day. And now, of course, we must all regret that because we were part of a colonial imperial history which we should be ashamed of. So after the last glacial maximum, and here you can see England, Ireland, Scotland, all under the ice. And when the ice started retreating, the area was recolonized, reoccupied by hunter gatherers, Stone Age hunter gatherers who were blue eyed and dark skinned, we now know from the DNA studies. Quite a surprise. And from the Mediterranean refuge areas that they withdrew to while the Ice Age was on, they moved northwards again, crossed what was to become the English Channel, but which wasn't there then, it was merely the river system. So it wasn't that difficult to move. And when they got there, what did they eat? There was plenty to eat. There were plenty of things to eat you too. There were bears, there were wolves, there were wild boars. But there was a reasonable lifestyle for a few people. Then Europe was massively transformed by two migrations. First of all, reaching the rest of the continent by about six and a half thousand years ago, but only reaching Britain just after 4,000. Farmers from what we would now call Turkey or Anatolia, coming eventually from what perhaps makes sense as the Fertile Crescent, and then followed another 2,000 years later by the steppe pastoralists, the Yamnaya peoples particularly, steppe pastoralists from the eastern steppes, the grasslands of Eastern Asia. Of eastern Asia. Those Neolithic farmers were prosperous, organized societies for 2,000 years. They're the builders of Stonehenge. They had what you would expect farmers of that kind of environment to have. 
and they have left behind field boundaries and they had a very prosperous way of life on the whole. Now, what happened when people moved in like that? Here from the DNA studies, we get some of the characteristics of the Stone Age hunter-gatherers. Here they are with their dark skin and their blue eye, which you can see when the early farmers arrived, there was a major change. Here, the dark skin suddenly becomes light skin since the hunter-gatherers were to a large extent replaced by the farmers. And then when the steppe pastoralists arrived, another whole range of changes of characteristics, of physical characteristics, some of them very interesting. The decrease in the need for vitamin D, why? Because the steppe pastoralists were like most of you and me, lactose tolerant. In other words, you can drink milk as an adult. That's not a very common thing amongst human beings, but it was one which the steppe pastoralists brought with them. For my family, you can see there the redheads, particularly an increasing proportion, until eventually we ended up with so-called white Europeans who are genetically and historically are a relatively recent invention. So which of you can read Sanskrit? Sanskrit, what's that? Any of you read Greek? Any of you read Latin? Probably some of you. But here is William Jones as a British civil servant with the East India Company in Calcutta in 1786. And his education allows him to make this kind of observation. The Sanskrit language, whatever may be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, more exquisitely refined than either. Can you imagine having that understanding and expertise in languages that you can make those kind of statements about them? And the affinity which he notices, so strong indeed, no philologer could examine all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source, which perhaps no longer exists. And William Jones was exactly right. He had put his finger there on the Indo-European root languages from the Indo-European area of India, of the Middle East, and the development, for example, there is a common word, one of the fundamental root words of Indo-European languages, the word for brother. Bratha, you can see it starts off with, it becomes brater, it becomes brat, perhaps significantly to some people. And as it moves west, as the people carrying it move west, it becomes bruder and brother. In the Romance languages, the BR turns into FR and it becomes Frata and Freya. And in South Africa, the younger generation habitually greet each other, hey bra, how's it? And they think they're being very up to date. In fact, they are using one of the most ancient Indo European root words. So the Bronze and Iron Age pastoralists brought a complete change of culture, chariot, chariots, warriors, metalworking, the horses, the wheels, the raiding, the fierce gods, the druids. And as far as Leicestershire is concerned, you can see here Iron Age settlement in Leicestershire and Rutland, which is as dense as the present day settlement of the county. And there is Glouston, And they concentrated on horses, they horses and oxen, metalworking, some of it really exquisite. And here in Leicestershire on Borough Hill, the excavations of what was not only an Iron Age site, but a Bronze Age site prior to that. 
And there is an excavation of an Iron Age, an Iron Age hut or house, which to those of you from this part of the world, from the border and Transkei, will look very familiar. It's a round, thatched house. The door faces towards the sun. There is a cattle kraal just outside. And then the Romans arrived and set up the beginnings of the city of Leicester on the basis of the Iron Age settlement. And as far as Gluston is concerned, Gluston was right there on the Roman road, the Via, de, the Via Divana, which passes right across the center of the country. There it is, you can see it as a straight line. It takes a kink across the stream, and then it continues further up, heading towards Leicester, and known to my ancestors as the Gartry Road. We didn't speak Latin, we spoke Old old English, and particularly we spoke English. And the word gar is the old English word for an ash tree. And the word ash itself is again a fundamental Indo-European word. And there it is. There's the Gartry Road, the Via Divana, the Roman Road, still in perfectly good order, and those of you from the border part of the world will note that it is entirely lacking potholes. There, part of Leicester, the Jewry Wall, 2,000 years old, there is a modern university building built next to it on the close to the site. And I would like to bet you which of those two will be still lasting in 2,000 years' time. And there, not very far away, recently discovered, published, I think, in 2015-16, this marvelous mosaic floor in a Roman villa, where if you look carefully, you will see it is actually part of the of Homer's Iliad, the Trojan War. There is Hector in his chariot, and there facing him is Brad Pitt in his chariot, representing Achilles. So here we have a Roman villa owner in England, into 300 AD, literate, knows his literature, and has it transposed into a mosaic floor for his dining room. It's just amazing. And there is the kind of food available in the market in Leicester, in Roman Leicester, which varies very little from the market which is still there in Leicester to this day. I'm not so sure about obtaining the opium, but I think pretty much everything else you would be able to get. And then came the Angles. The beginning of the so-called Dark Ages, not a term which I'm prepared to accept for my ancestors. Sometime towards the end of the fifth century, said Michael Wood on BBC, a band of people picked their way up a little stream which flows down between low hills west of the River Welland. Heading towards the Kibworth Ridge, their track led past British villages, ruined Roman villas, by Langton Brook and on Gluston Hill. Men, women, children, horses carrying packs, tents, and the recent DNA studies show that this was a process, an in-migration, which went on for the best part of 500 years. And there is the stream that they crossed. That is the actual drift that they crossed at the time on the Lipping, which was the stream which my family have been drinking from for nearly 2,000 years. And the name of the stream, the Lipping, is found only in one other place, which is in Jutland, in the south of Jutland, in Denmark, in the area from which the Angle people came. Archaeological evidence, for example, among them was a striking young woman, around 20 years. We assume she died in childbirth. Round her neck hung a bear claw amulet and a large orange fluted Roman bead. So here we have the mixture of cultures. Although historians love to divide things up into sharp periods, in fact, the boundary lines 
between peoples and cultures were nothing like as clear. And I say the so-called Dark Ages, have a look at that. That's a pendant of an Anglo-Saxon princess. Are you going to tell me that's produced in a Dark Age? The craftsmanship is stunning. So let's have a look at some angles on the angles. These are the original, this is the history of the people. This is where the angles came from, from the area of southern Denmark, northern Germany, and into the eastern part of England. The study from 2022 shows us quite clearly the areas of origin of the Anglo-Saxons into England. The archaeology shows us the same pattern, but it shows us quite clearly the area of Angle settlement as opposed to the Saxon settlement of the southwest and south. And what after the Viking arrival and King Alfred's peacemaking with the Danes became Dane law. It became a settled part of England with its own law based on Angle law and the continuity into Viking law because the Vikings came from pretty much the same areas. There was a continuity there as well. When we look at the language, we get language changes and dialects and place names which are all traceable. And those bright green areas particularly are the Angle language areas. Dane law again showing up. The language, the place names and the fact that we are now speaking English, we are not speaking Saxon. It is the East Midlands, Leicestershire and its neighbors from which English as we know it actually comes. And even if you take something which might not have occurred to you, dancing, traditional dancing, even that shows the same kind of pattern. The dancing of the Cotswolds in the Southwest is distinctly different from that of the Anglish area. And there are traditional dancers from Leicester, the Red Leicester Morris dancers, in what you will have heard the colloquial term glad rags, put on your glad rags. That is exactly what is meant by glad rags. And although some people object to people using blackface, you will notice that the Leicestershire Morris dancers cannot be accused of being dressed in blackface. These are traditions and customs which have carried on for thousands of years. If we have a look at a site two kilometers from Glouston, these are angle pottery sherds found by the Hallerton Field Walkers groups, and there, on the basis of their initial discoveries come the archaeologists to consider where exactly should we dig. This is the Nave Hill site, two kilometers southwest of Glouston, and Glouston is there just over the hill underneath the name there. There is a geomagnetic pattern showing, giving an indication of where the concentration of remains might be. And there eventually you bring in, to start things, a JLB, and when you get down to the finer points, you're using a paintbrush. The people here are each digging an angle, an angle cremation urn site. And there, showing how the cultures were mixed and how this part of Leicestershire was a border area as well, just like our border history area. This is a burial in this, on the same site, alongside the angle cremation burials, which are all women. And then somebody digging found a spear point, said, oh, and dug further and found it was the burial site of an Anglo-Saxon couple. So it was unusual because it was in an angle cemetery with an Anglo-Saxon couple. And it is a couple, not just a single burial. 
And then, of course, being good angles, we make sure that we have reasonable size buckets for our beer. And from the angle Danelaw area came all sorts of all sorts of background heritage which we still have, which you would not recognize, I'm quite sure. But the angles used not a decimal system like the Romans and the Normans, but a duodecimal system. In other words, it was based on the number 12. And everything worked on 12, and almost all traditional English measurements do the same. Here, in terms of the land areas, the Vapentaka, which is literally the weapon shaking agreement in a community meeting, you raise your spear. A caracate, those of you with a little Latin would recognize this is from the Latin word for a plow. It is the area which can be plowed by a span, a full span for the English, a full span of eight oxen in a year. Notionally, approximately 120 acres. Notice the 12. And then the divisions of it, which you can have quite easily. A quarter is a yard land plowed by two oxen, an ox gang plowed by one ox. And out of that whole concept comes a furrow, a furlong, the basic measurement of a furlong of 220 yards. And by the time you've plowed four furrows, you have four rods wide, a chain, 22 yards, a cricket pitch, which if you look at the laws of cricket now, you will find a cricket pitch is not 22 yards after all. It is 20.1198 meters for heaven's sake. But we have all sorts of other things which you don't even think about. A dozen, a baker's dozen, 13, a gross, 12 by 12, 144, a hundredweight, which is 112 pounds, the stone, 14 pounds, and so on. You have an inch, you have a foot, which has 12 inches. And you have a mile which is a Roman concept. There is a Roman mile, which is fairly close to an English mile, but it's based on a foot and a yard, not on the Roman measurement. And the reason for having a geodecimal system is because you can have a half of it. You can have a quarter. You can't have a quarter of a 10. You can't have a third of a 10. But you can have a third of 12 and you can have a quarter of 12. No problem at all. And there, for those of you in the Border History Society with the Transkai background, you will know the residential sites in the Transkai were measured by chaining them. There it is. It comes from the chain there of 22 yards. So residential sites are two chains by two chains, which is 44 by 44, or near as damn it, 50 meters by 50 meters in modern terms. And that's where we get the typical residential site locally. Beliefs, traditions, customs over thousands of years. Here is a reindeer, a reindeer headdress from 6,000 years ago. Here's a stone circle from the same period. Here is a carved rock carving of a tree of life, which I'll come back to you in a moment in a different context. That's very close to where my sister lives in England. And still to this day, there are maypole celebrations and dances at the site of that stone. The days of the Christian week. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday, Woden's Day, Thor's Day, Freya's Day. Things we don't even consider and think about anymore. There is the ash tree, the gar tree road with the ash tree. And there is the Anglo-Saxon rune, the rune for ash. 
for the tree, or the letter A, A E A S K Ash. Here we have in the 1500s John Leland's observation, thought sometimes to be the first archaeological field report. To these borough hills every year on Monday after White Sunday come people of the country thereabouts and shoot, run, wrestle, dance, and use other feats of like exercise. These customs have been going on for hundreds of years. And among the rugby enthusiasts amongst you might recognize this. Here's the origin of rugby football. It's the Hallerton bottle kicking on Easter Monday, which again is about two kilometers the other side of Glouston. It's a scrum between two villages to carry three kegs of beer across the stream at the bottom. There are no rules. From Hallerton itself, there was an amazing archaeological discovery earlier in the 2000s, where over 5,000 Iron Age and Roman coins were discovered from the site, including parts of a Roman cavalry helmet. And this is weird, because the discovery is at exactly the point in time of the Roman invasion. So what's a Roman cavalry helmet doing there before the Romans arrived? And then we come to the written records of the Doomsday Book of England, produced by National Survey at the orders of William the Conqueror in 1085. And it took nine months to cover the whole country and produce a survey of everything in it down to the last chicken and pig. Every piece of land, every piece of woodland, and there it is, the report for Glouston itself at that time in 1086. There is the report for it, belonging to Hugh de Gramony. Three caricates of land, one plough and domain. There were four acres of meadow, woodland, one furlong by three furlongs. And the value of the estate had risen from three shillings to 30 shillings from 1066. And that is where the Colmans come from. And there is Glouston Wood, exactly as described. One furlong across by three furlongs in area. It used to go up to that hedge there, where if you look carefully, you will see the gray light colored are the May hawthorn trees. And that is where it used to run up to as three furlongs long. There it is a thousand years later. And the same thing for the village from which my maternal line comes of Stony Stanton and Sapcot, which are almost twin villages. And then Glouston in the history records in between times during the Middle Ages, describing what it was like. A Roman villa stood on the banks, the Glouston church from 1220, at least, the open fields, each of which had their own name and subdivisions into strips of furlongs, the overlordship through the Duke of Lancaster and the present owner, and the enclosures that took place and how people's lives were changed. Twelve people deprived of their livelihood by enclosing pasture. And at one time there was a windmill, and it was still there in the 1600s. Then this marvelous project from started about 10 years ago, published in 2015, 16, the People of the British Isles Project. They looked for people who had grandparents who came from a cluster within 80 kilometers, all of the grandparents, in other words, rural people who by implication, the family had been there for a long time. And you will see the different clusters of DNA genetically grouped by statistically. But for almost the whole of England southeast, they could not distinguish. There's no change in the DNA. 
whereas for Devon, even Devon and Cornwall are separate groups of people genetically. So then if we take that genetic evidence, we come up with your typical English person who has 36% or so Anglo-Saxon blood, 20% or so Celtic, original British, another 20% from Western Europe and particularly from Western France, and 10% or so from Scandinavia. If you concentrate that down to the East Midlands, where we're particularly interested in terms of my family, then the Anglo-Saxon percentage goes up even further to over 40%. And if you take my DNA, which is where all this got started from when the family paid for me to have my DNA tested, you can see there that my genetic background from Anglo-Saxon and Western Europe is 84%, much higher even than typically for the West Midlands, with very little else, a touch of Old British and a touch of Scandinavian, maybe a Viking got in the family at some stage. And in the process, we need to remember that Leicester University is where DNA study started. And here, if we take the Coleman family history, the villages in the center of England, within that limit, such as they had for the British People Project, here they are. These are all the villages. The yellow are records from the Coleman family. Green are records from the Western family. And these are the written records going back into the 1600s. So we've got nearly 500 years of record here. And all of these people came from within the same small area. In this whole period, there are two records of people who married into the family from outside this area. So in other words, it was enormously stable. People did not move around. And there in 1970, myself and my eldest daughter, who is now a professor of software engineering in Australia, we may, we're looking at 20 generations at least of people, maybe 50 if we go back to the Angle migrations. And now, in two generations, the family is in California, in Washington, in Connecticut, in South Africa, in Australia, in New Zealand. We live in a totally different world. So how do you build a family tree like this? If you're lucky enough to have family records for, coming from England, then it's relatively easy because the record keeping is phenomenal. But what you need each time to put together a family tree from myself, going back to my earliest male ancestors in the 1600s, you need a source, you need a person, you need an event, a relationship, a place, a date. And this is what a system like Ancestry.com gives you. They make it easy to access. They have literally billions of records. So here, for example, is one of my ancestors, Mary Barrett, right? who married a Samuel Coleman and had a son, John Coleman. Here is Mary Barrett. There is the source, England Select Marriages, 1538. Thank you to Henry VIII. That's the source, the person, Mary, the date, 1766, the event, her marriage, the place, Gloucester, her spouse, Samuel Coleman. But you need to remember in proudly tracing your family like this, that by the time you've gone back a few generations, we follow a particular line and I can say, yes, John Coleman in the 1600s was my great, 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 great grandfather. But in fact, he's one of 4,000 ancestors by that stage. 
So every generation back, remember, it's doubling mathematically. So we're all actually descended from a lot of people. The Ancestry.com website is absolutely awesome to use. They put all of this together for you. The little green leaves on each one there tell you that there's a hint, which will give you 10 or 15 possible ancestors to have a look at and check on. But what they really blow my mind with is that in many cases, they can find an image of the actual document. So here is my great-grandmother, Elizabeth Bale. Here is her ancestor, Samuel Bale, and his wife, Elizabeth. And there is an image of the written record, Samuel Bale and Elizabeth Adams of Naseby were married June the 27th, 1640. And it's the kind of thing which really just wants to make you cry when you see it. When the formal census is started, that really helps because it shows a whole family together. So if we take the record for Amos Coleman, my great grandfather, in 1841, there is Amos at eight years old, male, eight years old. There's his father, Samuel. But hang on, there's another Samuel down here. And there are Sarah Coleman, Sarah Coleman, Sarah. There are four Sarah Colemans all on the same page. So you have to be meticulous in checking. One of the ways you can check is the census then gives you their occupation, agricultural labor. And where were they born? Everybody was born in Gluston. If you look at Amos, you see, oh, there's a Sarah Col Samuel Coleman. Sarah, but that can't be his wife. She's 78. No, it's his mother. Where's his wife? His wife was Martha, and she died in 1839, two years before, when Amos was six. So the occupations that you can get from this kind of record. There's Stony Stanton Quarry, where the other side of my family worked. And my great-grandfather was a set maker, in other words, a skilled maker of cobblestones, taking granite and cutting it into exact cobblestones. There is what that quarry looks like today. It's in fact one of England's leading aqua training centers. Amos himself went to the Crimea to fight in the Crimean War. There are his discharge papers, which again, the kind of thing those of you with military characters in your family will understand how this affects you. Here is Amos's discharge paper after 20 years. He served in the Crimea for six months. He served in North America, in fact, in Canada for eight years. He served in India for six years. And overall for 20 years, 323 days. And then he was discharged with a good record, and he found himself a willing lady and continued the family. There, amazingly, Leicester University Agri Archaeological Services produced another discharge paper from 111 AD. It's not on paper. It's much more substantial than that. It's actually on a copper sheet. And it is the discharge paper of a Leicester soldier who signed up with the Roman army in 84 AD. In 87 AD, he went to Romania, what's now Romania, to Dacia, fought in the Dacian campaigns in the first cohort of the Legio Secunda, the second legion of the Roman army. And the, this cohort, the first cohort 
British, a thousand men, were an outstanding unit. This discharge paper tells you they were awarded the emperor's own family name. They became the emperor's own cohort. They were awarded talks to wear. They were given a regimental, a regimental motto, PA et fidelita, loyal, true. In their expedition in the Dacian campaign. And most important, ante America stipedia civitatis Romana stated they were given Roman citizenship. This was unheard of before they had finished their service. And there was Marcus Ulpius with the name of his father from Leicester and his son actually signed up and served in Romania in Dacia in the same unit. The uncanny link, my wife found by coincidence, a video of a guy who's driving around the green lanes of England, and he's driving here up the Gotri Road, the Via Divana, which is where Marcus Ulpius marched when he left Leicester to go and serve in Dacia. And guess what the guy is driving? He's driving a Dacia duster. How's about that for coincidence? So we end up finally with the Gluston mail line from the present back into the 1620s. with, when you have them available, photographs. This is my grandfather at his engagement, Amos Samuel Coleman, who married Florence Vincent, my grandmother, who sadly I never met because she died before I was born. But lovely, they were married on Christmas Day, 1903. This is where we come from. This is who we come from. Gluston, Gluston Church, where I found the record of a born Margaret Coleman in 1592. That's my sister. And the name has never been used between then and now until her name popped up again. And there, Gluston Churchyard, the graveyard, and the Coleman headstone. So what did I get out of this investigation that struck me? The common European ancestry, but most Europeans have this same ancestry with three main population sources. The continuity of spiritual ideas, I haven't spent a lot of time on that in this presentation, but it really just struck me of all the things, particularly related to water and water sources. The stability of settlement, the layers, Almost all these Leicestershire sites, there's evidence for Neolithic, Bronze, Iron Age, Roman, English, Medieval, Modern, all on the same site. And then the 20th century all change. And we become scattlings from Gluston to California. The website and the internet, awesome databases. Google it, YouTube it. And it's just mind boggling what you can find. But are we losing something as well? We seem to be losing written sources, the family letters, the books. And I think we need as a history society to be aware of that and start to give it some thought. Thank you very much indeed.